little bit about the sun. So everybody knows the sun. Everybody knows that it's a free renewable energy um, and that it's very abundant everywhere around the globe. But um, it's even more abundant in uh, least developed countries. So uh, countries with low develop, human development in the index, basically. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you don't see a lot of uh, photovoltaic technology in these countries. So they have a very small photovoltaic capacity. And this is mostly because uh, conventional photovoltaics, like based on, uh, on silicon technology, is very costly. Unfortunately, this um, does not allow for, uh, for broad um, implementation of, of photovoltaics, let's say. And because of that, for example, if you look at Ethiopia, um, a one square meter solar cells with a 5% five per, five power conversion efficiency would be enough to cover the uh, annual energy use of, of each people living in Ethiopia. But they can't really do that right now because the, uh, the photovoltaic te technology is too expensive. And um, providing them access to this kind of clean renewable energy means that they would have warm food, uh, better education, uh, better access to hospitals and healthcare. So the social impact of, of this kind of research is, is very important. As I was mentioning though, the conventional photovoltaics, so silicon-based photovoltaics require costly materials and also costly equipment. And also if you look at the little um, figure here, you can see that you need to heat the silicon at uh, temperatures over 1,400 degrees. So because of that, you also need a high energy input, which means you will also generate uh, carbon uh, dioxide emissions when, when you fabricate your, your solar cells. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look here, you can see that they're not um, visually very attractive, let's say, they're not beautiful. Um, and because of that, because they, they don't fully harmonize with nature or with, uh, with constructions, basically, uh, they're often rejected by local communities. And so it's very important to find new technologies that are more adapted to, uh, to developing countries. So organic soil cells are very different from silicon soil cells because they present uh, several advantages with respect to, to these uh, conventional soil cells, let's say. Uh, one of them is that they have a fairly simple device architecture where um, the active layer and uh, part of the electrodes can be deposit, deposited by uh, low cost solution processes. They can be prepared as uh, semi-transparent devices. Uh, they can be flexible. So you can integrate them into a variety of, of new technologies. So for example, these kind of, of bags with integrated solar cells are printed organic solar cells in the shapes of leaves. You can make solar trees. Uh, you can make uh, windshields, solar windshields for next generation of uh, solar powered sports cars. So um, in general, let's say you're not only looking at engineering, but also creative, um, creative kind of technologies, let's say with design mixed with, uh, with engineering. And um, as uh, during the introduction, I, 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 was, uh, or I was presented as uh, one of the pioneers um, who was able to overcome the milestone of 10% of power conversion efficiency for organic soil cells. Uh, that was in, in 2015. I was actually quite proud to be one of the first uh, researchers to, to make these kind of soil cells. But it's in only five years since then, um, now my, my record efficiencies have been largely overcome and uh, now the new record this year is 18% and it's probably going to grow very quickly. Uh, but today I'm not really going to talk about uh, the power conversion efficiency, but I'm going to talk about uh, sustainability and other, uh, other issues, let's say. But first of all, let's talk about the working principle of these devices. So uh, organic solar cells are, the active layer is composed unlike silicon, is composed of at least two materials, one electron donor and one electron acceptor. When you shine light on the active layer, one of the materials will absorb the light and generate an exciton. The exciton will then diffuse to a donor acceptor interface. Well, you ha you will have an electron transfer. So if if it's if the uh, light is absorbed by the donor, like in this case, uh, you will have an electron transfer from the the lumo of the donor, sorry, to the lumo of the acceptor, and this will basically generate free charges. So the electron on the acceptor and uh, the hole on the donor. 
uh, once these charges percolate back to uh, to their respective electrodes, you generate photocurrent. And mostly, like for any uh, photovoltaic devices, you're looking at four main photovoltaic parameters. Uh, the short circuit current density, JSC, which mainly depends on the amount of light absorbed and uh, on the amount of donor acceptor interface. The VOC, which is associated with intrinsic properties of the donor and the acceptor materials, and especially the LUMO of the acceptor and the HOMO of the donor, as well as um, the amount of, ch of uh, charge traps or defects that you can find in these materials. Uh, then you have the fill factor, which you can think about as um, the efficiency with which charges are collected after being uh, photogenerated. Uh, so this mainly depends on defects, charge recombination, leak currents, and so on. And of course, uh, everybody judges these, these kind of photovoltaic devices through the power conversion efficiency, which is the ratio between the power input, so the solar, solar energy, and the power output, which is an electrical power in this case. Now, I was talking about uh, these uh, semi-transparent or transparent devices, and um, I presented them as being very easily integrated into a variety of, of, of technology. But to do that, you need to fabricate something that I like to call invisible photovoltaic windows. Um, in, by invisible, I mean by, that um, you don't realize that it's there. And unfortunately, most of organic soil cells are only based on two active materials, one donor and one acceptor. Um, it can be a fullerene acceptor or a non-fullerene acceptor, but because you only use two materials, you can't uniformly absorb the visible light. So you end up with these kind of devices here that have a, a kind of like red glass aspect or blue glass aspect, depending on which materials you're using. So what we tried to do in my lab was to add another component to, to this, this active layer here, which is composed of PCDTBT and PC71BM. We added this ITIC, which is a, a new non-fullerene acceptor, which has complementary absorption properties to the two other materials. And using this, you can see here that we made photovoltaic windows that have a completely neutral color. So you don't see any red color. Uh, they still have a transparency around 40%. So 40% might not sound, sound very impressive, but you have to think about the fact that regular windows have a transparency around 70%. So if you compare the photographs here, you can see that um, you still have enough light incoming inside your, uh, your apartment, your commercial building or anything. And unlike regular windows, they generate um, electrical power. So 40 watt per square meter. Now, one of the important things in this research here for us was to have a photovoltaic window that has a high color rendering index, which means that the colors, the natural colors are still perceived in the same way when you look through your photovoltaic window. And by using a combination of these three materials, we were able to get uh, color rendering indices over 95, which means that it's almost exactly the same color as uh, when you look through a regular window. Now, there are still major issues associated with uh, organic soil cells. And mainly these issues are related to green and sustainable issues for the, during the active layer deposition. Because um, the active layer is mainly deposited uh, through a process called spin coating. So I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with spin coating. Um, and they know that when you spin coat a solution, you waste around 90% of, of this solution. The major issue with uh, organic soil cells is that the active layer solution not only contains costly materials, but also hazardous solvents like chlorobenzene or dichlorobenzene. So when you waste 90% of these hazardous solvents into the environment, let's say, you generate a lot of air and water contamination, which can cause a lot of health issues like lung diseases, skin rashes, or infertility. Um, so what we tried to first um, understand is if we could modify the active materials so that they become water soluble, why is that? Because unlike uh, chlorinated solvents, which are dangerous for health and the environment, water is very eco-friendly. So you can waste water, or we shouldn't waste water, but even if it's released in the environment, it doesn't um, cause major issues, let's say. Uh, what we tried to do was to use the, the uh, state-of-the-art donor and acceptor materials, so P3HT, which is a conjugated polymer, and PCBM, which is a filler and derivative. Um, and we tried to make these two materials water-soluble using different strategies. So the first strategy for P3HT was to make, uh, to make it ionic, let's say. So add 
these kind of ions, ion, ionic groups at the end of the, the side chain here. Uh, this is a common strategy actually, which is normally used for interlayers and not for active materials, but um, it makes this, this kind of uh, P3HD based material soluble in water. The other strategy that we employed for PCBM is uh, to add a polyethylene glycol um, or a polyethylene oxide polymer, let's say, uh, at the end of, of, uh, of this, uh, this little molecule. And this also becomes water soluble. So by combining these two, we deposited active layers in a very environmentally safe uh, method. But unfortunately, the uh, power conversion efficiency decreased from around three to 5% for these two materials deposited from chlorobenzene to, uh, oh, sorry, for, from dichlorobenzene uh, to uh, 0 0.3 to 0.5% for um, active layer deposited through water. So um, uh, one order of magnitude lower power conversion efficiency. And of course, we wanted to find a method to achieve higher power conversion efficiencies, even though we were using water as the solvent. So to do that, we used an alternative approach, um, which is called the Lenfester method or the mini emulsion method, in, in which you first prepare uh, the organic semiconductors into a, a chloroform solution, and separately you disperse a surfactant into an aqueous, um, aqueous solution, basically. Uh, these uh, surfactants are used as dispersing agent. You then start mixing these two phases here. Uh, you, you use ultrasonication, you use steering, and you generate these kinds of, of mini emulsion here. After evaporating chloroform, um, you can actually collect it and reuse it, so it's, it's still environmentally safe. Um, you get these kind of uh, nanoparticle dispersions in, uh, in water, so a, co a colloidal solution. Uh, but unfortunately, when you do that, you leave the surfactant here uh, on the outside of the nanoparticle, which generally causes issues when you try to make uh, electrically active devices. So uh, you either need to remo remove it by washing or you need to find alternative strategies. So what we tried to do was to make um, surfactant that is electrically active by combining a conjugated polymer with a water soluble uh, coil. So these kind of amphiphilic molecules can act as surfactant and as electron donor in your devices. And thanks to that, we were able to make um, devices with power conversion efficiencies around 2.5%. percent. Sorry. So this is um, similar performances to uh, those deposited from uh, chlorinated solvents. So you're making uh, environmental friendly devices, but um, with like, just a, a small reduction in, in, uh, in performances, let's say. Um, one of the problems though still remains, uh, because you're using spin coating, you're wasting a lot of material when you deposit your active layer. And the other thing is that even though you can collect most of the chloroform here, you're still releasing a little bit into the atmosphere. So instead of um, you know, trying to go towards uh, environment friendly solvents, we thought about reducing wastes during uh, active layer deposition. So uh, basically finding alternatives to uh, spin coating. And one of the process that we thought about is called uh, push coating. Push coating was first employed in 2012 by uh, Ikawa et al. Uh, it's published in Nature communications and what they did was basically uh, deposit a very small amount of uh, active layer solution or active material solution uh, which is 20 times less than what they use for spin coating and on top of that they press a silicon elastomer so a PDMS stamp basically. Uh, because of capillary forces the solution will spread between the substrate and uh, the stamp and um, after you have after that you have a second step where the solvent will di uh, diffuse into the PDMS and what you obtain is a um, um, nice like active layer with uh, with no material waste so it's very sustainable fabrication and on the other hand the solvent is trapped inside PDMS temporarily so it's very easily recycled. Uh, they were able to apply this to our organic field effect transistors. Uh, we first verified that we were also able to apply this technique to uh, 
OLED uh, fabrication and also to nano fabrication, as you can see here with uh, nano porous or nanopixel like uh, structure fabrication. But uh, unfortunately, when you go to uh, organic soil cells, you're not only using one active material, but two in the blend. So um, the drying dynamics of your films uh, become much more important. So we still tried to see if push coating could be used for organic soil cell active layer fabrication. And to have a fair comparison, we, we didn't only compare it to spin coating, but also to other techniques like spray coating or blade coating. Uh, as you can see here, uh, compared to push coating, blade coating uses, uses twice as, mu as much um, solution. Uh, this is still 10 times less than spin coating, and spray coating uses approximately half of what you use for uh, spin coating. So if we think about it in terms of green and sustainable process, uh, push coating and blade coating are the best. Uh, but unfortunately, unlike push coating, when you use um, blade coating, you have a decrease in power conversion efficiency. So for spin coating, you have around 5.8% of power conversion efficiency, which is the same for uh, push coating, but when you move to electro spray or spraying, let's say, and blade coating, you decrease this to below uh, 5%. And another aspect that you can see here is what I like to call the cost performance index. So it's written in Japanese yen, but you can think about it as, uh, as uh, US cents here. So 25 cents for spin coated active layers, uh, which you reduce to 0 0.7 or 0 0.6 cents per percent for uh, blade coating and uh, push coating respectively. So some people might still not be satisfied and think that we could further reduce the production cost of organic soil cells. And to do that, uh, we looked into another sustainable strategy. Uh, instead of um, using synthetic electron donors, uh, which basically generate a lot of hazardous waste during their production and cost around 1,500 US dollars per gram, like PCDTBT, we use natural electron donors. What are the advantages there? The first advantage, advantage is that the extinction coefficient of beta carotene extracted from these carrot wastes is um, over 10 times larger than, uh, than what you get for uh, PCDTBT. The other advantage is that you can use this basically, the, the carrot skin to e extract beta carotene from it. So the cost is reduced to one fiftieth of PCDTBT or virtually it's actually recycled for, from waste. So you're not spending anything. Um, just for an idea, it's around 30 US dollars per gram if you use just normal carrots, let's say. Uh, the issue is that the power conversion efficiency is also reduced by a factor of eight. So still, if you compare the 50 here and the eight here, it's still quite nice in terms of uh, cost performance. Um, one of the major issues with this beta carotene though is that it degrades very quickly when exposed to air. So um, if you look at the, the uh, photo bleaching dynamics here, here are the absorption spectra of beta carotene thin films. Within 10 minutes, the absorption of beta carotene completely disappears. So they're entirely photo oxidized. On the other hand, uh, typical fullerene acceptors that are widely employed in uh, organic soil cells do not degrade uh, within 24 hours when exposed to sunlight for 24 hours uh, continuously. So what we thought about was to add these kind of uh, PC71BM molecules to beta carotene films and observe the impact of this addition. And here you can see the various ratios. And if you use a one to four ratio of beta carotene to PC71BM, you can actually um, slow down the degradation dynamics of beta carotene up to one hour. But after 24 hours, you still have a complete degradation of uh, beta carotene when exposed to, uh, to sunlight. So this is not enough to produce stable devices. However, if you add um, an in-situ encapsulation with the top electrodes and especially with uh, molybdenum trioxide and silver, you can see that even after 24 hours, there's no decrease in absorption from beta carotene. Uh, and on the other hand, it slightly increases actually in these, uh, these thin films. And because of that, you can fabricate uh, devices that are that basically do not show any decrease in uh, power conversion efficiency without encapsulation or let's say just with the encapsulation by the electrode. Um, they don't show any decrease up over three months, sorry. So I think here, yeah, over, over, over six months, sorry. Um, 
after six months, because of, of uh, oxidation of uh, the silver electrode, they start degrading a little bit. But this, of course, could be improved by adding an encapsulation layer like epoxy resins. Uh, so we solved the issue of durability. How do we solve the issue with the low efficiency? Um, we're still doing that right now, but what we're thinking about is to use um, Tomato skin, so tomato skin wastes and extract lycopene from it because lycopene has much higher um, charge uh, transport, if you, uh, sorry, tra charge transport properties. So uh, the the devices should work better than uh, than with beta carotene. We're also, of course, looking to uh, promote circular economy through other methods, and especially because so far I've been focusing on the active layer, but that's not the most expensive part of the organic soil cell. The most expensive part of the organic soil cells are these transparent conductive electrodes. So in, in this case, what we call an inverted organic soil cell architecture is based on indium tin oxide, zinc oxide, um, multilayer transparent conductive oxide uh, substrates. And uh, if you think about it, these are very durable, actually. Um, the organic layer and uh, the top electrode might not be so uh, long lasting, let's say. But um, when you think about the, the potential uh, applications for these kind of devices, you usually aim for a lifetime of around five years. But after these five years, you will just discard everything together. And uh, basically a short lifetime means more wastes. So what if you could recycle the expensive materials from these wastes here and basically re-inject them into the uh, fabrication cycle? Now, if you want to think about it and um, see how you can remove or recycle the, uh, the ITO zinc oxide substrates. First, we need to remove uh, the active layer from it. And uh, in this case, for this research, we used um, relatively recent materials, PBDBT and ITIC as uh, electron donor and electron acceptor re respectively. We deposited the active layer and the electrode on top of it, and we tried to remove it simply by ultrasonication in uh, dichlorobenzene. You can see here from the absorption spectra that um, when you deposit the active layer, you, you see a clear absorption from, uh, from the active layer here, which completely disappears when you treat the uh, device with uh, dichlorobenzene by ultrasonication. However, if you look at uh, the uh, device performances, when you recycle just through this dichlorobenzene ultrasonic treatment, you have a large decrease in power conversion efficiency from 8.7% for the reference device to around 4% for the recycled device. So you need an additional step, at least. Uh, we tried to do thermal annealing of um, the recycled substrates. So after the dichlorobenzene treatment, we anneal the substrates at 200 degrees for 30 minutes. And when you do that, you can recover much more of the initial power conversion efficiency, and you get a power conversion efficiency around 7.1%. This was still not enough for me. It's still too far away from, from the initial power conversion efficiency. So what we tried to do was to perform an additional surface cleaning step and then uh, do thermal annealing afterwards. And the, this uh, surface cleaning was performed in acetone surfactant and water. This is a traditional cleaning uh, process for uh, for electronics, let's say, uh, silicon or or, in orga or organic um, electronics, the same. Uh, and by doing this, so we recovered uh, power conversion efficiency, which is very similar to the reference power conversion efficiency. And also, you can recycle the substrates up to ten times, um, and you still get quite decent power conversion efficiencies here, around seven point nine percent. So with this procedure, you get very nice results, but we also have a major issue. Every time you recycle one substrate, you use 10 milliliters of dichlorobenzene to recycle that substrate. So we're back to our pollution and uh, health issues. So you're using and wasting a lot of dichlorobenzene. So how can we change that? We used two ideas. The first one was to replace ultrasonication with something more mechanical that I like to call rubbing or, or scrubbing. Um, by doing so, you can reduce the amount of uh, solvent that you're using from 10 milliliters to 0 0.5 milliliters per substrate. And also by changing the solvent from the toxic dichlorobenzene to a low toxicity um, sustainable solvent like limon and extracted from orange peels, you can also considerably uh, decrease the impact that you have on the environment. If we look at the performances, um, even though the performances of uh, one-time recycle 
devices are better for uh, dichlorobenzene with ultrasonication. Uh, you actually get better results with rubbing and especially with limonene uh, when you try to recycle more than one time. So for 10 times recycling, you get a better power conversion efficiency with uh, limonene and with rubbing. Also rubbing can be applied to larger area devices. So uh, it's much more sustainable and more let's say adequate for industrial applications. Uh, we were actually able to link this kind of results to the uh, surface morphology of uh, the zinc oxide layer that we employ in our devices. Initially, you have something like a nano ripple structure here. Um, and when you use ultrasonication, you have a tendency for a chemical etching. So uh, you don't scratch off this, this uh, zinc oxide nano ripples, but you have thinner ripples and you have thinner layers of zinc oxide. So after a number of recyclings, basically you will make the zinc oxide completely disappear here. And that's why you lose in terms of performances. On the other hand, when you use rubbing, you don't have any chemical etching because you're using a very small amount of solvent, but because of the mechanical etching, you will planarize your, um, your surface. So uh, little by little, you will remove these nano ripples. So this affects basically the uh, light diffraction inside your active layer. So it slightly reduces your initial initial performances, sorry, but uh, it won't affect so much the performances when you recycle more than once. Uh, so with this, I'm going to summarize a little bit what I said today. I, I talked about a lot of different things, so I'm, I'm going to give back the ideas. But what we're trying to do initially is to fabricate a neutral color photovoltaic windows. So to do that, I showed that it's better to use more than two active materials. And again, I recommend reading this paper here, which uh, in my opinion is, is very interesting for those who are not familiar with the organic soil cells. We also propose several um, fabrication processes that uh, allow for better or more sustainable and, and environment friendly uh, fabrication of organic soil cells. Among all the processes I showed today, I think push coating is my favorite because uh, not only do you reduce the impact on the environment, but you can also reduce the cost for the fabrication of uh, organic soil cells. We also showed that you can use um, natural electron donors from um, waste, so either from carrot skins or hopefully soon from uh, tomato skins as well. And finally, that uh, recycling uh, the costly substrates from degraded OSCs could be one of the major methods to, uh, to decrease the cost of uh, organic soil cell fabrication and also reduce the amount of electronic wastes around the globe. And with this, um, I would like to quickly thank a couple of, uh, of colleagues in uh, Italy, at Sofia University in Japan, uh, in uh, Romania, and of course my students and uh, Professor Okada's group at uh, UEC, as well as a lot of financial support that was necessary to, to conduct all this research. Mm -hmm.